you want to start with the components that are not sticking up too much. These are 10 kilo ohm resistors. They are brown, black, orange and gold. You might not see the gold. You will see on the board each part is actually carefully marked so you can see what to put where. The 10k resistors, there they are. So what you will see is that we've actually marked this board quite carefully. So these are the positions that we want to put these 10k resistors. So here we go, let's put, put them there. And there you can see it. There we go, that's a nice clear shot. So there we go, that's the first part on the board. And now we need some no clean solder. Don't go buying any solder, buy, make sure you get some no clean solder. That's nicely soldered onto the board and this is a decent soldering iron with a fine point so don't go and buy a hardware grade soldering iron make sure it's an electronic soldering iron okay and let's clip off the extra length so one little 10 kilo ohm resistor at a time and pull it through on the other side. You might have already figured that out, but there is a part that's a bit lower than a resistor that I didn't think of really. And that would be these jumpers where there's a black line on the board that indicates a jumper because this is a single sided circuit board so being a single sided circuit board to keep the cost down a bit it needs jumpers put in place where there's a black line on the board that indicates a jumper because this is a single sided circuit board so being a single sided circuit board to keep the cost down a bit it needs jumpers put in place we can just take ordinary telephone wire so here we go we've got a, a piece of wire and we just feed it just like feeding a resistor we feed it into these jumper locations so there it is we put that in place. Let's have a look with the magnifying glass. There you go. Now we do need to pull it flat on the board and we give it a little tug on the other side. And now it's much flatter on the board. It's not sticking up to short circuit onto things. We can put it over here. We can have a look at that. That's nicely soldered. We can clip. Is we basically soldering our jumper wires in wherever you see a black line on the circuit board that indicates that a jumper wire is needed. Remember to wipe the soldering iron every time you pick it up before you touch the board if you want to keep the board clean and clear of um, dirt and carbon and stuff. So let's look at how we're going with this board. Not so bad and we take this uh, magnifying glass we're putting the wire in on the one side and then we flip the board over and we solder it and then we feed the wire in on the other side I think this goes faster than perhaps doing it the other way
This is what a 10 kilo ohm resistor looks like. The color coding there is brown, black, orange and gold if you can see that. And Remember, if you are soldering two holes that are right near to each other like that, for example, don't block up the other hole as you're soldering because you still need to keep the other holes clear to fit the other parts. This is a lovely circuit board. It's been developed for us by Mantec Electronics. And they've done a beautiful job. It's a very easy board to build, actually. So let's have a look, see how we're going along so far. That looks pretty good. So we've got 10K resistors in place there. Over here, the circuit board needs a 1K resistor there, which would be uh, brown, black, red and gold. That particular resistor is a current limiting resistor for the LED. So that's a 4.7 kilo ohm resistor or 4K7 resistor. They are yellow, purple, red and gold. So let's have a little inspection here. It looks like the resistors are up there. This board is marked to show you which way around that transistor needs to go. There's the flat side, there's the round side, and it shows the part lying down. So there's the part and now we squeeze it down onto the board we squash it down flat onto the board you don't want things sticking up too far out of the board so there it is it's squashed down flat ever so nicely if you do not get this on the board the correct way your board will not work so that is correct flip the board over and transistors, you mustn't sit on the transistor with heat for too long because you can damage the part. So you must solder it quickly. What we normally do is we solder the middle pin and then we just check it hasn't moved and that it's sitting nice and flat. And we solder it like so. These transistors in this part of the circuit facilitate communications between the serial connector and the microchip. So your computer connects here and it uses these transistors, well, these three transistors in this area to send signals backwards and forwards between the microchip and your computer. And this one th in mic November 13811M in 13811 is a brownout a reset integrated circuit. In fact, what it does is it resets the chip if the voltage drops too low, if your battery and your robot's flat. This next part is also a 2N3904 and this one goes over here and it faces the other way and you can see that again it's indicated by the markings on this printed circuit board. And let's have a look with a magnifying glass. There it is. Solder the middle pin. Check the part hasn't shifted. And then solder both pins. If you were to put the part standing upright on the board, that flat side would be there. Because we've bent the legs over, the part, 
lies with a face up. So if you put these parts on your board and you can't see the part number facing up when the part is laying down like that, then you've done it wrong and then your board will not work. So there we've done it right. The part is in place. Let's just see if we can catch it. There we go. You can see the part number there, 2N3906. Now the next part is quite interesting. It looks like a transistor because it's got three legs, but it is in fact not a transistor at all. This part is a what's called a brownout detector, and you'll see there it's got a code on the body saying 13811. This part is in fact a 4.5, 4.5 volt brownout detection device. It's an integrated circuit and it goes just like the transistors. You fold the legs down. But let's show you for a moment. That's obviously wrong because according to the little picture over there, you've got a flat side towards where my finger is. So if you look at this part here, it must be orientated that way. There you can see the flat side. And if we were to just mount it onto the board, we could put it like that. And then, let's have a look at the magnifying glass. So if we were to put it like that, that would be correct and it would work. There it is. We bent the legs over and that part numbered and if you can see it, MN 138.11. And we put that part on the board just like the transistors and we squeeze it down flat. We solder the middle pin. Again, don't keep your soldering iron on the part for too long. Make sure it hasn't shifted. It's sitting nicely. And solder the two outer pins. There we go. This is the integrated circuit socket that's going to hold our main processor. And what you can do is if you put it on there, when you turn it over to solder your board, it's going to fall out. So what you want to do, and this is important, you want to take a ball of press stick, which might be called blue tack, depending on where you're living in the world. Now what we're going to do is we're going to put a lump over there, and we'll put a lump over there. And this is to stop this thing from falling out while you're trying to solder it in place. Basically you want to only solder one pin on each corner of that part. You want to solder it on the one end, you want to solder it diagonally across on the other end. And then you want to make sure, you can take these Presti balls off now, and you want to have a look at that. You want to make sure that it hasn't shifted. Because if it's lifted up, you're going to have problems and your circuit won't work. But what you want to do is you want to make sure it hasn't come up and out. Or from this side, you want to look at those pins and make sure they're all properly sticking through and that it's sitting down on the board properly. Otherwise when you push, if you don't get that right, when you push your integrated circuit onto that socket, it might break the tracks on your circuit board, which is going to be a big disaster and you're going to have an unreliable circuit and your robot won't work. And that's no fun. Black always represents a zero, brown represents one, red represents two, orange represents a three, yellow represents four, green is five, blue is six, violet is seven, and gray is eight, and white is nine. So now if you think about these values used as a first and a second digit and a multiplier, you'll be able to figure out the value of resistors. Remember there's two types of resistors, there's your typical four band and your five band color code resistors. Don't worry about it. There's easy apps for your cell phone that you can get off this, the internet. Okay, so let's just check if we've soldered the other points on our integrated circuit socket. 
So let's go down here quickly. This is why you need this is why you need a pretty fine tipped soldering iron. Okay, the next item we need is an 8 pin dip dual inline pin integrated circuit socket. That marking there is quite significant. It shows you which way around to put the integrated circuit in. So let's see if we can see it with the, there. That little bite out mark, that half circle, shows you which way around to put the integrated circuit. Again, when we put this part in place, it's going to simply just fall out if we do not hold it in place with our blobs of press stick. And before we go any further with the soldering, so we do like that, and then we do on the diagonal opposite side, and then we stop and we have a look if the pins are still sticking through. It actually looks like it did shift a little bit. If it shifted a little bit, you want to warm it up, warm the solder a bit, and push those pins through while the solder is soft. Now the pins are sticking through properly. Okay, now we've got a blob. When you've got a blob, you do that. You just use the soldering iron to pull the blob away. Right, once you've got that on the board, you take the press stick away and you just inspect it, make sure it's flat. Okay, and that's looking pretty good. Okay, so on this board I've got both bite outs on the integrator circuits at the top there. There you can see it, and there you can see the bite out. So you know which way to put the chips on the board. That is a 20 megahertz crystal, quartz crystal. They're various types, you even get one with three legs out. And that goes on the exact same spot that also says 20 megahertz there. Don't apply excessive heat for too long to that part. I think the next thing we can do on this board is we can uh, put our switches on. We've got a little reset switch which resets the microcontroller and that's what it looks like on the front. That is in fact what it looks like on the back. It's got a line running down the middle which indicates where the contact breakers are. On this board you can only put it in the correct way around. We've got that in position and make sure when you flip it over. You could put a ball of press to go over it to stop it from flipping out, but it looks like it's holding quite nicely in position there. Now let's just solder it into place. And there we go, click click. There you go, that's a little slider switch that we're going to put on the board. And let's put a little bit of press stick to keep that thing nice and straight. And that doesn't matter which way around that goes in, but just to make double sure everything is hunky-dory, let us solder the middle pin. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take off the ball of press stick and just check that it looks straight and then do the other pins. It's looking good. Just by way of information, this is your main processor on and off switch. And this sub switch here switches your motors on and off, which is quite a nice feature because it stops the rover from driving off the table while you're trying to reprogram it. We can mount our LEDs on the board. And notice again, there's a flat side which corresponds to a flat side on the pot. Now I know it's not easy to see. You'll see there by my thumbnail, there's a little bit of a flat side but the rest of the part is kind of round. So just make sure that the flat side corresponds to the flat side on the board. And then everything will work like it should work. So we put a green light there to indicate the processor switched on and a red light here to remind you that the motors are on. So the robot could take off and drive off the table at any moment. That's why that LED is red. So we do that. There's the flat side.
We need these two capacitors over there. And those you'll see the value 104. So that's 10 and 4 noughts. So that's a 104 capacitor, which is 0.1 of a microfarad. Difficult to see all these fiddly little things, so we're going to put this on the board in the little spot indicated with that round picture. Building electronics has never been this easy. And these are the two little decoupling capacitors in the serial communication stage. Let's have a look close up at the magnifying glass. There they are. The next part we're going to put on this board is an LM2940, and that's actually a voltage regulator. We want a heat sink on that part because when the motors on your robot are running, they're being powered by that through that part, so it gets pretty hot. This stuff is like white silicon lube for the heat sink. This is is what the heat sink looks like so we you don't want a lot of this stuff you want a very small quantity of this stuff on this part let's have a quick look at the part okay so that's the part there that's what it looks like and if you look very carefully you can just make out those markings lm2940ct and it's got a marking there also 5 volts there's also a 12 volt version so you got to make sure you got the 5 volt version you can take a little allen key or a little tool like this you want to bend the legs around a tool. You don't want to bend them immediately by the casing, they'll break off. Then what you want to do is you want to take the tiniest little amount of this silicon stuff. You don't want so much that it goes everywhere. So that should be about the right quantity because it's going to squeeze between. It's going to squeeze hard between this part. And I usually don't put stuff here to conduct the heat off the heatsink onto the board. So what we do is we put this part onto the board there and then it's a question of lining up and that you can use a screwdriver or tweezers or something like that but you want to just pull that part around a little bit to line up that hole. So this is a little cap head screw. Fortunately the bolt is mostly about earth so we put that in there and we have a look at the bottom to see how far it's sticking out. You don't want it sticking out too far. So you want it sticking out just the right length. You must use a nylock nut on stuff. That's sticking out a bit much. So I'm going to actually put a washer at the top. I've got this little cap head screw and I've got a socket here. And I'm just tightening up that little now, and that extra nut there is going to conduct a bit of extra heat off the part. Right, so I'm going to put another washer. So now that I've got it straight, then I'm going to tighten that up pretty tight. There it is, that's our voltage regulator in place. Here we've got a serial connector. It has five pins there and four pins there. It's called a DB9. Check that your pins are quite straight so it fits in the board if, if it's been squeezed or squashed in your parts box. And now we need to put this part. This is the part that's going to take all the wear and tear over many years of programming every time you plug and unplug your robot to your computer. We need what I call button head cap screws so that the top of the nut and bolt combination you use mustn't stick out too much and get in the way when you're trying to plug your connector cable on here. You don't want something that sticks up too far. So this is the ideal part. That's what it looks like called a button head cap screw and this is an M3. When these parts are on the board they mustn't stick out too far. We're going to need to put spaces over here and over here otherwise when you tighten up these nuts and bolts it's just going to crush this part. So what I'm doing now is I'm putting one nut on there, putting a nut on there and I'm going to put another nut over here. You need to really tighten this lot up because if this all works loose you've got a real problem. It's going to break your tracks on your circuit board and you're going to end up with a robot that doesn't work. And now you need another nut because one nut is not enough to create that space. So you need another nut and you need to tighten that other nut up very tight as well. There's still a gap in there that needs to be filled with two washers. 
So you've got this little button head screw, you've got the two nuts, the two washers. Now you feed it in nice and straight and you will notice that this part is now correctly spaced when you there can you see now that's correctly spaced so it's the little bowl the two nuts the two washers and then you must put nylock nuts nylock nut that's a little nut with a little nylon insert to stop it from coming unstuck so that's what your nylock nut looks like it's got that little nylon collar at the top there they haven't been tightened up yet so I'm going to tighten it up and then show you what it looks like the other side as well and nice and tight if you look at the board you'll see the board is not bent the part has got just the correct amount of space and it's a very solid situation because this is the one part of your board that might break if you don't build it right and when those nylon you'll see that those bolts are the perfect length they just reach in there grab onto that nylon collar and now you've got to solder the pins of the serial connector the db9 serial connector that's our row of connector pins there this is what they look like before they soldered on the board I'm going to use the old prestic trick to hold this while we solder everything into place That's what it looks like and that's where you're going to connect stuff to your microcontroller. There's little minuses over there. That indicates that this is where you connect to zero volts or minus. And you'll notice there's little pluses over there which indicates that that connector is where you connect positive volts. Just check that those pins have not shifted, that they're still sticking through the board like that. So we can put another row of these down here because we've also got negative connectors coming out there. But we'll only put that onto the board once we've mounted a breadboard in the space because we don't want to put that there and find the breadboard doesn't fit. This is an electrolytic capacitor. It looks a little bit like a battery but it's not a battery, it just stores a bit of electricity. Okay, the negative is next to the shorter leg usually, but it's indicated with a minus and a line up the side of the most capacitors. This hole there has got a big plus over there. So the longer leg's got to go in there, and you'll notice you've got a few spare holes there, and that's for different sizes of capacitors. We have to put our little connectors and then we're nearly done. These are our connectors. I take a tiny dot of Prestic and I put it into this part to prevent this part from falling straight off the board once you put it on the board. And this part must be pressed completely flat on the board because if it rides up a bit when you plug in a server it's going to break the tracks on the underneath of your printed circuit board. So it's critical that this part sits down properly on the board. You'll also see some markings as it's S for signal and then plus and minus. With these critical parts, you solder the middle pin and you check it very carefully. You have a look, see that it's sitting down on the board properly with a magnifying glass. If we can get in there.
and then we solder the two outside legs remember to check before you just finish soldering I see that little part there it's a little bit close I'm just going to push that out of the way a little bit using a blunt type of thing and then I can squeeze that part in there and we're pushing that part quite flat onto the board Board. It's pretty much done. We need to test it before we put these chips in place here. This area here is where you can put circuits. There's an extra positive there. There's negatives over here. But you can also simply with double-sided tape, you can put a breadboard in this area here. And you can mount little electronic parts like LEDs and other items. This particular breadboard is clear so you can see these metal parts here it doesn't connect across the middle you'll see the middle is clear most of these breadboards are white which is quite nice it helps you to see the colors of the parts so to test this board we need a power pack and we need a voltmeter and if you see smoke and if you touch your finger on this part and things are getting hot then you would want to disconnect your battery power immediately because you've got a short circuit on your board somewhere. If you can see the LED lighting up there and when I switch this switch that LED lights up so that's promising. Okay so we've got 9.29 volts so our battery pack is healthy. So we've got 5 volts coming out of our regulator and now we're just going to go around the board a little bit and check some voltages. 5 volts over there is correct, no volts correct, no volts and 498 volts there, that's fine. And we're going to check on our microchip. Should be no volts, 5 volts, correct. No volts, no volts, no volts. 498 volts, no volts, 496 volts. 491 volts, so that's all looking good. And that should say 5 volts. Try that again. And when we press the reset button, that should drop to no volts. So that's all checking out fine. So at this point, we can confidently put our microchips onto this board without expecting smoke, expensive white smoke. Okay, that glorious moment has arrived where we can put the microchips on the board. This is what a chip looks like. Wear a static collar on your wrist. This is in fact the DIP, the dual inline pin version of the basic stamp 2. We call it the P1X8 which means processor 1 times 8 bits and it's a lovely processor. It programs in basic. It's incredibly easy to learn but it's powerful enough to use for industrial applications. The 24LC16B, that's an electrically erasable, programmable, read-only memory chip. Remember that an ordinary microchip won't work on this circuit necessarily with the Parallax software, so you do need to get the original chip from Parallax or from Mantec. Make sure that the pins are properly and securely located into the holes before you press down on the chip. There we go. Now, mounting this baby, it's quite expensive, so you want to be careful. The first thing you want to do is you want to put it loosely. Don't press it down at this point. But you want to put it here, and you want to look at how badly out of alignment the pins are. Can you see they're not lining up with the holes? If you press that chip down now, you're going to break the pins off the processor and you can throw the processor in the dustbin because there's no way to reattach the pins to it. So what we do is we take the chip and we squeeze it gently down on a flat 
even the surface to bend the pins a little bit inwards towards each other like that but don't try and do it you must press it flat onto something we need to do it a little bit more because they're still a little bit out of alignment with the holes you can see that there be very careful not to bend these pins out of alignment you want to squeeze a little bit more like so right what you'll see now is that the pins having squeezed these in towards each other having squeezed these pins in a little bit on a flat surface towards each other this chip is now lining up nicely with the pins with the holes on the mounting socket if you look like that with a magnifying glass you must be absolutely certain before you press down you must be absolutely certain that those pins are locating into the holes let's check on the other side too if they're not locating into the holes when you press that chip down into place you're going to have a disaster so there it is must check visually that every pin is located into the holes on the socket and once you've done that once you've gotten to this stage you take your fingers like this and you press down there you would have heard it going crunch into the board and you press it down on that side and there we go I'm going to make an entire video about how to pull a chip off a board without breaking the pins off the chip but do not try that at home because you're not likely to succeed before you've watched my video on how to do that it's ready to take a program we're going to put an LED on this board here and just link things up so there is our brand new P1X8 rapid prototyping board. We're going to try and program this board. So we're powering up this computer. This is a USB to serial programming cable. There we're mounting up two LEDs onto the board over there. Okay, so let's write a quick program where we're going to identify the hardware and we're going to select the language version. We're going to do a do and a loop. It's pretty simple stuff. And we're going to go high on, say, 10 and pause 500 milliseconds and low on 10 and pause 500 milliseconds and high on 5 and pause. 500 milliseconds and low on 5 and pause 500 milliseconds and now we can actually download that program into the robot and that should flash the LEDs but we do need to connect things up and we're going to strip this piece of wire off here or earth sides of these parts connected up and we do like so here are the numbers so according to our program we've just wrote it's on P5 and P10 so let's look for those numbers remember with this particular board you don't have to put a current limiting resistor in them because they've already we've already got them over here and we put that into 10 number 10 there's number 10 so now we've hooked everything up let's see what happens so we're going to plug in the USB cable to the PC and we're going to plug the serial cable and we connect up the battery power make sure it's all switched on and then what we're going to do is we're going to go to the computer and hit F9 and there we've hit F9 and wow that's awesome I think that's maybe one of the few boards that I've ever built that has worked first time without having to do extensive checks and the reason for that would be because Mantec has spent a bit of money helping us to make these beautiful printed circuit boards that build so easily I've built this in one sitting and I must say I'm pleased so let's try download again 
notice a momentary pause and then it starts flashing again and there it is so I'm going to change this program ever so slightly I'm just going to zoom in so these pause values over here I'm going to change to 200 milliseconds 200 milliseconds 200 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds and let's zoom out a little bit Okay, we're going to zoom out a little bit so you can see that. Now we can see everything. We can see the program. We can see the LEDs flashing. When I hit F9, you can see the dialog box. And you'll notice as the program tokenizes, and look how those LEDs sped up there. And what we're going to do is we're going to download the program to the robot while you're watching. And can you see how they sped up after the program loaded? So. Remember, this whole board is not just there to flash LEDs. This board can control industrial machines. It can control solar panels. You can charge and discharge batteries. You can control your home with this board. And you can build our desktop robot. I hope you'll follow our videos, subscribe to our channel. And I hope you'll build this into a little desktop robot. And there it is. So there's the robot you can build using the board I've just built in this video.